that isn't working is rusted because they uh, don't have enough power to keep it going. As if they couldn't provide power for the seventh wonder of the world and this additional supplement to it that's in this museum. Now that boat, the whole book about it that I'll be dealing with as we teach on the pyramid, King Cheops, they call it. They love to give Cheops uh, credit for lots of things. So I pulled it down, Joe, so they could see. Yeah. Are you looking through your monitor? Yes, sir. King Cheops, royal ship. And now you can zoom in a little closer on the boat. But that uh, boat was discovered. It was quite a mess when first discovered. I think I got a picture in here of it. what it looked like. Uh, when they first opened up the pit. That's a nice picture there of uh, a close-up from uh, a section of the boat standing in it taking the picture. And we're talking about a boat that they date back to a Cheops whom tradition says built uh, this pyramid. <clears throat> That's a pretty old boat. And I think the fellow who restored it spent about 16 years. There's nothing wrong with uh, his dedication or his work, but it seems almost criminal that they uh, do not have uh, air conditioning and the museum better suited to preserve this grand structure. Uh, I can't find the picture of the way it was when they found it. I'm spinning through this that fast, but it was a wreck, to say the least. There's a close-up picture of the museum. It's just along the south side. This is the south side. The entrance to the Great Pyramid is on the north side. You can see up about the 35th course where my finger is here, where um, our good and wonderful uh, predecessor interested parties in the pyramid blasted trying to find a southern entrance into that pyramid. <clears throat> it's a nice picture of the, the three of them casting shadows in the sunrise. You'll see the museum along the south side of the Great Pyramid. Don't think that's the entrance. That's the blasted out section that uh, was there because someone tried to find an entrance on the south side. And the history books traditionally credit the pyramids scatter all up and down the Nile Valley. Air the Steppe Pyramid attributed alternately to Zoser and Sneferu near Memphis. This is the land of Goshen, this area in here, which is where the brothers of Joseph were clustered, the best part of Egypt. Upon the plateau are the three great pyramids credited to Cheops, Kephron and Giza, and uh, Mycerinus at Giza. Then the North Pyramid at Abu Rosh. But if you can come in a little closer, Joe, we'll scan down. You'll get a feeling of how many pyramids, and this is not all of them. For example, there are nine on the Giza Plateau. They only named three, but the three are the prominent ones. Pyramids all through here. The outstanding ones are usually credited to <clears throat> Zoser, and then the one that uh, crashed down, there's really only a mound of dirt there because it didn't stay, is credited to Sneferu, but again, they're not sure whether uh, his father, Huni, started it and he completed it. Some theorize that this one crashed down while 
Sneferu, who was credited with building the bent pyramid, was starting to go at the steep angle, and when this one crashed, so he didn't want to be embarrassed, he finished it at a more sympathetic angle. Sheer speculation. And they give Sneferu credit for this one. Now, on the list of the dynasties, Sneferu is given a reign of 24 years. So he's ultimately credited with various scholars of building this one that crashed, the Bent Pyramid, this is two views of it, and the Red Pyramid. So that means he would build three giant pyramids in uh, 24 years. We took a calculator out the other night and counted the stones it would take to build this one, didn't we? See, I'm in the business of, of teaching faith in God's Word and uh, continually, and, and of course, uh, Cheops or Khufu is his Egyptian name, is credited with building the great one on Giza. And his son, Kephren, is supposed to have built this one. And Kephren's son, Mycerinus, is supposed to have built the third one, which was built in two stages, allegedly. And notice all of these have downward passages. None of them have the ascending passage as uh, the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Now, all these theories are exactly that. And you can come to me now. You can go back to your camera, Joe. No, i got more pictures to show, so just stick around, but come to me for a minute. See, Christians are belittled because they are asked to have faith. And I'm in the business of showing you the basis for a faith. I've spent my life trying to point out you don't have to be a moron to be a Christian. You don't have to park your brain. There is a great deal more substance of fact which gives evidence <clears throat> to the rightness of faith and there is for some of these other convoluted theories that scientists put on you as though that's unassailable fact I, mean, I get amused at the fundamentalists worrying about evolution I don't think it's a very threatening idea but it's a theory it's not a fact it's a theory to explain facts <clears throat> there's a substantial amount of facts to support the theory but it's still a theory among many alternative theories. The one most broadly accepted in the scientific realm, but it's still a theory and it presupposes another theory. And its facts are no good unless that theory is presupposed in faith. The things have always gone on at the same rate, more or less. Mountains take about as long to wear down. Sedimentary mountains push up and wear down into plains. The Bible suggests that things have not always been the same. Cataclysms. It assumes that man used to be less than he now is and has progressively been getting better through evolution. The Bible says man used to be a lot greater than he is now got worse. A series of cataclysms created major changes. Now we come to the pyramids. They would have us believe that these were built as gigantic funeral deposits for these uh, fourth and fifth dynasty and uh, the later that those are the oldest pyramids and the later pyramids is tombs or deposits for the bodies of the pharaohs of the later dynasties the fifth and sixth and starting about 25 2600 BC they would have us believe that uh, Sneferu either became the first ruler of the fourth dynasty or the last ruler of the third dynasty and that uh, no more than two pharaohs 
preceding him, the last pharaohs of the second and third dynasties, Zoser, maybe starting it, and his son Hunai completing it, and Sneferu finishing what Hunai started, and eventually we come after some practice pyramids to uh, Khufu or Cheops, and they all did this for great funeral reasons, burial grounds. Maybe this book is worth reading a little paragraph in before I get started. One of the puzzles, this is the boat beneath the pyramid, one of the puzzles about the fourth dynasty is that there are more pyramids than there are kings to bury in them. <laughs> but some pictures, and then I want to uh, attack this funerary idea. It's like when I went to university, I lost my faith because people made me think I couldn't really graduate intellectually or academically until I rejected a belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the miraculous resurrection from the dead. In his place, they offered me a Christ that never existed. A good and wise teacher in the same order as uh, the Gautama Buddha or Muhammad, other founders of respected religions. The only problem is Christ doesn't fit. The facts won't allow it. You can think those high lofty thoughts about the founder of Buddhism or the founder of the Islamic faith. You can't about Christ. That's why I wrote the book, Jesus Christ, Super Nut or Supernatural. He's either a nut or a phony or what he said he was. But they would have, you know, I was respected academically to accept a Christ that could not be found in history. We're not supposed to believe that God had anything to do with these pyramids. That's four out theory. The intelligent approach funeral, megalomaniac, funerary monuments. Uh, we'll see. Some nice pictures. I like the pictures in this book. Yeah, isn't that a beauty? Pyramids at sunset. There's Giza and the second pyramid. That's not the best one. Some theories even suggested they were built by Joseph as granaries. They were up there long before Joseph got there. I like these pictures. Some in here I can't show you. They're pretty, pretty raunchy. I mean, those Egyptians, the heat got to them. I mean, you know. Some of you porno fans knew what was hidden away in the hieroglyphics of Egypt. You'd go nuts. There's the step pyramid attributed to Zoser. I insist it was a human attempt to copy what was already there rather than a predecessor. And my evidence is as good as those who say this was the first learning experience and they learned how through this and the demolished one and the bent one. I say, uh-uh. The good ones were there. This was an attempt to emulate. What are you going to do? Do carbon dating on uh, granite and limestone? There's Zoser Step Pyramid from another view. Not too impressive, is it? It's impressive, but alongside the Pyramid of Giza, it's not a. Look at that picture. Now remember that in this Great Pyramid, the first one, you can see, if Joe zooms in, you can see the little tower on the top even in this picture. And you can see the casing stones are still around the top of the second pyramid. And here's the third one. Now you, you want to remember, because it's easy to forget when you look at these pictures, St. Paul's of London and the Vatican both 
could be put inside this pyramid and not break the silhouette. Do you want to say that again? These are the greatest things on the face of this earth. St. Paul's of London. If you got a book, did Paul visit Britain over there? Bring it here quickly, because on the cover of that book, which, by the way, everybody ought to order, you'll have a head start when I get to that subject. But on the cover of that book is a famous photo of uh, St. Paul's in London through this rising above the smoke and of war-torn London. Now, St. Paul's, that great church, Broadway and Ludgate in London, plus the Vatican, can be put inside this pyramid, both of them, same time, and not even breach the silhouette lines. They'd be lost inside of it. If it was only a shell, you could just put it down over both of them. That, that's pretty enormous. That's the third pyramid there. Impressive itself, but standing alongside, that's the second pyramid with the casing stone still on up at the top. There's the Sphinx. All on that Giza plateau with the second pyramid in the background. Hello. Nice to have you who just joined us. I'm looking at pictures. The monument's on the Giza plateau. That's a rendition from Napoleon's day. You like these pictures? That's an artist's rendition of uh, the Arabs when they first broke their way in, going up the Grand Gallery. This is the entrance into the Queen's Chamber, the vertical uh, passage that leads into the Queen's Chamber. And then you have to... <clears throat> You have to project the floor line of this walkway. And they climb up and head on up. Pretty impressive. Better than those little black and white things that this is the way they look in the modern world <clears throat> over the smog of Cairo. 4,500 years by the traditional view, much more than that, in my judgment. I mean, you're talking more like, well, a lot more than 4,500 years. <laughs> no sense of getting ahead of the story. One more uh, drawing that's worth looking at. I thought I marked them all. No, that's all you get. That's the uh, map of the three. That's it. King's Chamber. We look at it on the drawings. And it seems uh, so small as, for example, there. Zoom in on that little drawing. As they go through the passageway, through the antechamber, then turn right in the king's chamber to go toward the coffer, you lose perspective looking at these little diagrams in relationship to human size 
this is the way the king chamber dimensions out. Having come this way through the antechamber, you turn right and go the 286.1 pyramid inches to the right. You come to that axis point where the coffin sits. And this, though, not the same shape in all dimensions as the Ark of the Covenant in cubic volume, exactly the same as the Ark of the Covenant. Not something to be ignored. And you get an impression of the size and know that above this are the other chambers that head on up in the uh, to the gabled roof that is several chambers above it. Some noteworthy figures in history have spent the night in this king's chamber and come out never the same. Now, we're supposed to not believe that God had anything to do with this. These people who didn't even have perfected pulleys, didn't even have a mathematical system, <clears throat> had no modern equipment of any kind, built this great thing after a couple of experiments, step pyramid, and then the one that folded. And anybody is just not really too smart that doesn't accept the fact that these were built as tombs. Okay? But the notion that pyramids were built as pharaonic tombs has remained unsupported by concrete evidence. One of my favorite writers, Zachariah Sitkin, only one other scholar in the 20th century that matches him, in my judgment. I even include Einstein. And that's Valakovsky. But this is what Sitkin has to say. The pyramids built as pharaonic tombs has remained unsupported by concrete evidence. And you know what pharaoh means. It means great house. It was uh, the name for king. And they took on the designation. They were the great house. All the people dwelt in them. So what do they need to build a pyramid for? If they themselves were the great house. But that's an aside. The first pyramid, that of Zoser, so-called, contains what scholars persist in calling two burial chambers covered by the initial mastaba. And you can go back to your camera, Joe. When they were first penetrated, now the purpose of what I'm saying tonight, as I set the stage for going back to the passages, is quit being so gullible with the world's frames of reference and so on the defensive with their tendency to put down the Christian frame of reference. I'll lay you odds that to people in my church, and certainly the pastor of this church, has critically examined the bases for my faith a lot more thoroughly than those who would try to cram these traditional ideas down mine and your throats. The first pyramid, that of Zoser, contains what scholars persist in calling two burial chambers covered by the initial mastaba. When they were first penetrated by H. M. von Minatoli in 1821, he claimed that he found inside parts of a mummy as well as a few inscriptions bearing the name of Zoser. These, it has been claimed, he sent to Europe, but they were lost at sea. Tough. That's that step pyramid I showed you a picture of. In 1837, Colonel Howard Bice, our famous forging friend, re-excavated the inner parts more thoroughly and reported finding a, quote, heap of mummies. Eighty were later counted and to have reached a chamber, quote, bearing the name of King Zoser, end quote, inscribed in red paint, one of his favorites. 
A century later, archaeologists reported the discovery of a fragment of a skull and evidence that a wood sarcophagus may have stood inside the red granite chamber. In 1933, J. E. Quibell and J. P. Lauer discovered beneath the pyramid additional underground galleries in which there were two sarcophagi empty. Now, that's the evidence that is convincing. It was built as a tomb. However, it is now generally accepted that all these extra mummies and coffins represent intrusive burials, namely the entombment of the dead from a later time by intruding on the sanctity of the sealed galleries and chambers. Somebody stuck a body in there long after it was built and sealed and not somebody who was around at the building of it. <clears throat> well, then I suppose when we eat some roast beef or a tomb, that's intrusive burial. You never thought of eating like that, did you? <laughs> well, has the cow been alive the last time you ate it? Probably won't eat any for a few days now. <laughs> and you will never forget what intrusive burial means either after that. But was Zoser himself ever entombed in that step pyramid? Was there ever an original burial? Most archaeologists now doubt that Zoser was ever buried in the pyramid or under it. He was buried, it seems, in a magnificent tomb discovered in 1928 south of the pyramid. This, quote, southern tomb, as it came to be known, was reached via a gallery whose stone ceiling imitated palm trees. Now, I don't subscribe to Zachariah Sitkin's theory about the purpose of the pyramids. Markers for uh, astronauts flying spaceships in a great landing zone area. But in achieving his theory, he has provided more evidence in collating together of archaeology and mythology and biblical and scientific research than anybody I've ever seen in one place. And his research, apart from the conclusion he draws, impeccable. This, quote, southern tomb, as it came to be known, was reached via a gallery whose stone ceiling imitated palm trees. It led to a simulated half-open door through which a great enclosure was entered. More galleries led to a subterranean room full of, or built of granite blocks and on one of its walls, false, uh, three false doors bore the carvings of the image, name, and titles of Zoser. Many eminent Egyptologists now believe that the pyramid was only a symbolic burial place for Zoser, and that the king was buried in the richly decorated southern tomb topped by a large rectangular superstructure with a concave room, which also contained the imperative chapel just as depicted in some Egyptian drawings. There is no proof that Zoser built it, And all evidence agrees his body wasn't in it. He was built in the, quote, southern tomb. The step pyramid, presumed to have been built by Zoser's successor, Sekhemket, also contained a burial chamber. It housed an alabaster sarcophagus, which was empty. Too hot in here, Brad. Textbooks tell us that the archaeologists who discovered the chamber and the stone coffer, Zechariah Gonaim, concluded that the chamber had been penetrated by grave robbers who stole the mummy and all the other contents of the tomb. That's not entirely true. In fact, Mr. Gonaim found the vertically sliding door of the alabaster coffer 
shut and sealed with plaster, and the remains of a dried-out wreath still rested on top of the coffin. As he later recalled, quote, hopes were now raised to a high pitch, but when the sarcophagus was opened, it was found to be empty and unused. Had any king ever been buried there? While some still say yes, others are convinced that the pyramid of Sekhemket was only a cenotaph, an empty symbolic tomb. I don't believe it was a symbolic tomb. For him, it might have been for somebody else. The third step pyramid, the one attributed to Kaaba, also contained a burial chamber. It was found to be completely bare. No mummy, not even a sarcophagus. Archaeologists have identified in the same vicinity the subterranean remains of yet another unfinished pyramid believed to have been begun by Kaaba's successor. Its granite substract structure contained an unusual oval sarcophagus sunken into the stone floor as an ultra-modern bathtub. Its lid was still in place, shut tight with cement. There was nothing inside. It's even hard to prove a murder without a body. The remains of the three other small pyramids attributed to the third dynasty were additionally found. In one, the substructure has not yet been explored. In the other, as of this writing, in the other, no burial chamber was found. In the third, the chamber contained no evidence of a burial at any time. We're still drawing a blank, aren't we, on this great theory for evidence. Nothing was found in the burial chamber of the collapsed pyramid the Midum, not even a sarcophagus. Instead, Sir Flinders Petrie found only fragments of a wooden coffin, which he announced as the remains of the coffin of Sneferu's mummy. Scholars now invariably believe that it represented the remains of a much later intrusive burial. The Midum pyramid is surrounded by numerous third and fourth dynasty mastabas, which are burial places in the ground, no question about that. More like a series of box-like coffins. These mastabas, in which members of the royal family and other VIPs of that time were entombed, have burial remains, but not the pyramids. The pyramid's enclosure was linked with a lower structure, which is now submerged by the Nile waters. So there's nobody there either. Next two pyramids are even more embarrassing to the pyramids as tombs theory. The two pyramids at Dasher, the Bent and the Red, I showed you those in the list earlier, were both, quote, built by Sneferu. Even this guy thinks that. I don't. The first two burial chambers, the other three, all for Sneferu? If the pyramid was built by each pharaoh to serve as his tomb, why did Sneferu build two? Needless to say, the chambers were totally empty when discovered, devoid even of sarcophagi. After some more determined excavations by the Egyptian Antiquities Service in 1947, and again in 1953, especially in the Red Pyramid, the report admitted Quote, no trace of a royal tomb has been found there. I'm going to propose that God was the architect and Enoch with the watchers, angelic helpers, was the builder. And I'm going to hit head on those who say, if you can't explain something, you attribute it to God. Not attribute it to God because the Bible attributes a very unique relationship between Enoch and God, and the pyramid has an absolute relationship to Enoch. And I'm with Josephus when he says, descendants of Seth, knowing a holocaust was going to hit the earth, writing this in the first century, preserved knowledge for future generations. 
in two places. One, in a memorial of brick in Mesopotamia, which is no longer around, according to Josephus in his century. The other, in Egypt, which still stands to his day, he said in his statement, Enoch was given the job. And I'm going to offer evidence. And in that pyramid is a prophetic pattern of world history. It is God's word in stone. God's message for this scientific age. Lock it in, Joe, and come around here. Well, you got any Bible? Yeah. Pretty good. I'll find it here in a minute. I'll tell you when to get your camera ready, Joe. Don't do it till I tell you. I born you? And all I'm really trying to do tonight is show that the alternative theory doesn't have any bases at all. But my theory's got some good bases. So don't anybody lift their ignorant nose at me. If you haven't done your homework, don't get your tongue in a crack. throw this book away right in your presence if it doesn't have what I'm looking for. But it isn't worth reading if it doesn't. But it's in the first few pages. Yeah. <clears throat> the unit of measure in the pyramid, as we've already demonstrated in a teaching that's preceded many times, is one five hundred millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the South Pole along its axes. The metric system is based upon the distance from the North Pole to the equator around the surface of the Earth, thus not a dependable measurement. The pyramid inch is one five hundred millionth of the distance from the north to the south pole through the axes or along the axes through the center of the earth. That pyramid inch times 25 is the sacred cubit. The Ark of the Covenant, the Temple of Solomon and the Pyramid, the Stonehenge all in case that measurement unit which is the measuring unit of the universe now, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 19, the scripture reads, and let's read it in the good old King James. Your camera's got a squeak in it. Now, chapter 19 is a prophecy of the future. That's made very clear with the 23rd verse. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria. It speaks of a time and events that have not yet come about. And in the 19th verse... In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Now, an altar is either a place of sacrifice or a place of witness. In this case, case it's an altar of witness. 
and it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Now, taking that verse of Scripture, that day being all to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, it's only one place, only one country you can say that about, by the way, because upper and lower Egypt, if you were Pharaoh of upper Egypt, you always wore the white crown. If you're Pharaoh of lower Egypt, the red one, the white sort of a bulbous crown. If you were Pharaoh of both, the great house or ruler of both, then you wore both with the white over the red, both of them showing. And when you look at the monuments, you can see the Pharaoh, whether he ruled upper or lower or both. And one of the confusions about uh, dynasties and the king's lists is that they would appoint co-regents on occasions. There'd be more than one pharaoh ruling at one time in one house. And at times there would be a pharaoh of upper Egypt and a pharaoh of lower Egypt at the same time, and at other times a conquering pharaoh who would unite. So there's much overlapping. But it is fair to say that Egypt has a spot that is both at the center of Egypt in the sense of the dividing line between Upper and Lower Egypt and at the border thereof. And that spot happens to be right where the Great Pyramid is sitting. So if this monument that God's going to have in the last day is going to be at that spot, somebody's going to have to move an awful lot of rock. Because the pyramid's in the way. But more significantly, if you take those words of that text, Isaiah 19, 19 to 20, and you spell it out in Hebrew words, knowing that Hebrew words, the letters have numerical meaning. Unlike English, it has letters for words and numbers for numbers. The letters were numbers. And each letter has a numerical value. So you take that verse in Hebrew, and you take the words, the first word, and give the numerical value to each letter. The four letters, 2, 10, 6, and 40, come out to 58. And you do that with each word in that text, and add up all the totals. It comes to 5,449, which is exactly the height of the Great Pyramid in pyramid inches. Now, you can call that accident if you want to. It's one hell of an accident added to all the other hell of an accidents along the way. And that's not the only biblical reference, but that's good enough for right now. And against all that evidence to the people who want to look, and most people who have not looked are just as ignorant, including Christians, just as ignorant about this as my professors were ignorant about Christ when they used to say the resurrection didn't occur because the resurrection can't occur, therefore the resurrection didn't occur. So anybody that says the resurrection occurred is mentally deficient because it's impossible for resurrection to occur. So anybody that says it occurs is a poor reporter believing the impossible because it's impossible to have a resurrection, so you shouldn't bother reading them anyway. Well, the one who looks says it's impossible for any man to have this happen to him, and if the evidence convinces me, then add to that that the one who made the claims about himself that Jesus made about himself is the one who rose. I'm taking a long look at him. And Christianity, as well as the world, is equally ignorant, not paying any attention to the pyramid. They immediately get critical of anybody that sees God's hand in it. Yet those same people are ready and gullibly to accept tombs. And most of those people that say tombs have heard more tonight in these few minutes about the evidence than they've heard in their whole life previous. Tombs. We left off at the bent and the red pyramids at Dasher. No trace of a royal tomb. Now we're getting close to the Great Pyramids. What's the evidence there? Want me to continue? Yes, sir. Oh, it's 
telephone. I'm reading from Zachariah Sitkin, The Stairway to Heaven, one of his trilogy of books. I do not subscribe to his theory of the purpose of the pyramids, but his research and the evidence from which he draws his conclusion is impeccable. I draw a different conclusion, but the evidence is impeccable. Now, he poo-poos the tomb theory. We had gone through the earlier so-called pyramids. I don't believe they are earlier. I believe they're imitations of the Giza pyramids. But the theory of, quote, a pyramid by each pharaoh holds that the next pyramid in line after those we discussed earlier was built by Sneferu's son, Khufu, or Cheops, as the Greeks called him. Now, we have the word of Herodotus and the Roman historians who relied on Herodotus, the so-called Greek father of history, that it was the Great Pyramid at Giza that Khufu built. We went through the mathematical impossibility of it being done in his reign, and I didn't even point out that Herodotus himself says that ten years were spent just building the causeway. So you got to take those figures I gave you and uh, multiply them by two. So that's a period. That's a, one of those uh, blocks shaped, fitted, and put in place every minute, rather than every two minutes, because we got to go twice as fast since we used up ten years on the. Now we we took a calculator the other night, counted the number of blocks in the Pyramid of Giza, and figured they'd have to have one shaped, shipped and installed one every two minutes seven days a week 365 days a year 12 hours a day now since it took 10 years practicing on the causeway they got to do twice as many so that speeds it up they got to do one every minute now every minute some of them 70 tons shaped, fitted, with optical precision, and put in place. And boy, I'm telling you, the muscles really had to be developed to put those top ones in place. I remember when we used to, uh, before I became a more dignified employee in the uh, park service, and started working on skis, and then went on to more prestigious work. I used to uh, first was on the trail crew and then bossed the trail crew and opening the trails every year, all the trails through Lassen Park. I enjoy it now if it ever get free because I know that park like the back of my hand. But every trail we had to open. So we had to open the trail for those that hiked to the top of uh, Lassen. We had to open the trail for those that uh, hiked to the top of Brokoff Peak or the trails that went up to Eagle Lakes and Cross country and Kings Falls and wherever. I remember that uh, in order to be able to put any time working at all on the last mile or few hundred yards at the top of Lassen or the top of Brokaw Peak, we practically had to put ourselves in shape to where we could jog to the point where we left off. Because a three and a half mile trail up to the top of Brokaw Peak carrying your tools, by the time we got to the last quarter mile, clearing the trail to the top, which some of the roughest, because it was up where the weather was the toughest, on an eight hour day, we had to practically jog. And we started at the headquarters at Minerals, so there's an hour driving through the park to get to the trail entrance and to get to that last quarter mile we had to practically run up the trail to have any time left to work and it never needed to be encouraged to, to run down when the day was over now put that in the pyramid context one of these 15 to 70 ton blocks every minute and we got the last few to put in place up there 40 stories up
one a minute. That's when you put a calculator to Herodotus. Yet he's been accepted by the traditionalists all these years. I'm telling you, anybody that could put in one in place a minute, that's as good a starting point for God as I can find anywhere. <laughs> Herodotus' word. Its chambers, even the unviolated king's chamber, however, were empty. That's what made the Arabs so mad. This should not come as a surprise, for Herodotus himself wrote that, quote, the Nile water introduced through an artificial duct surrounds an island where the body of Cheops is said to lie. So he built this tomb, and then they buried him on an island. Was then the Pharaoh's real tomb somewhere lower in the valley and close to the Nile? As of now, no one can tell, but if we're going to use Herodotus as our expert, he said he had buried in the valley on an island. Kephra, to whom the second pyramid of Giza is attributed, was not the immediate successor of Khufu. In between them, a pharaoh named Rodadef reigned for eight years. For reasons which the scholars cannot explain, he selected for his pyramid a site some distance away from Giza, about half the size of the Great Pyramid, it contained the customary burial chamber. When reached, it was found entirely empty. We're really batting a thousand on this theory, aren't we? And they want to poo-poo the work of scholars who've spent years in the pyramid, overwhelmed by it. It reminds me of Frank Morrison's Who Moved the Stone? One of the best proofs of the resurrection ever written. An attorney set out to take the miracle out of the story of Christ and end up writing one of the greatest defenses of the resurrection ever put in print. Davidson went down there to prove, as an agnostic, there was no divine message in that pyramid. Ended up writing the most convincing defense of the divine message. Second pyramid of Giza has two entrances on its northern side, instead of the customary single one. The first begins, another unusual feature, outside the pyramid leads to an unfinished chamber. The other leads to a chamber aligned with the pyramid's apex. When it was entered in 1818 by Giovanni Belzoni, the granite sarcophagus was found empty and its lid lying broken on the floor. An inscription in Arabic recorded the penetration of the chamber centuries earlier. What, if anything, the Arabs had found is nowhere recorded. So we don't know about it. Nothing's been found there. Giza's third pyramid, though much smaller than the other two, displays many unique and unusual features. Its core was built with the largest stone blocks of all three pyramids. Its lower 16 courses were cased not with white limestone, but with formidable granite. By the way, uh, Diodorus Siculus said it was the Black Pyramid. It was built first as an even smaller true pyramid, then doubled in size, and as a result it has two usable entrances. It also contains a third, perhaps a trial entrance, not completed by its builders. Of its various chambers, the one deemed the main burial chamber was entered in 1837 by Howard Weiss and his cohort John Perring. They found inside the chamber a magnificently decorated basalt sarcophagus. It was, as usual, empty. But nearby, Weiss and Pering found a fragment of a wood coffin with the royal name Men Ra written upon it and the remains of a mummy, possibly of Men Kora, he said. Direct confirmation of the statement by Herodotus that the Third Pyramid belonged to Mycerinus. So Weiss, who forged the cartouche of Cheops in the upper chamber, once again scored points in the press at home and justified his trip by finding this fragment of a wood coffin with the royal name Men Ka Ra written upon it, and the remains of a mummy, possibly of Men Kora, which would confirm a statement by Herodotus that the Third Pyramid belonged to Mycerinus. So vice is a hero, finally. Modern carbon dating methods, however, establish that the wooden coffin dates from the Satic period, not earlier than 660 B.C.,
Michalowski in The Art of Ancient Egypt records that test. And the mummy remains are from early Christian times. Score another slick one for Vice. He was long dead and gone. They did not belong to any original burial. There's some uncertainty. How are we doing on this? There's a lot of proof of this burial theory in there. Makes you really feel proud to have believed it so long. There's some uncertainty whether Men Ka Ra was the immediate successor of Kephra, but scholars are certain that his successor was one named Shepsikaf. Which of the various pyramids that were never finished, or whose construction was so inferior that nothing remains above ground, belongs to Shepsikaf is still unclear. But it's certain he was not buried within it. He was buried under a monumental mastaba, whose burial chamber contains a black granite sarcophagus. It had been penetrated by ancient grave robbers who emptied tomb and sarcophagus of their contents. The fifth dynasty that followed began with Userkaf. He built his pyramid at Saqqara near Zoser's pyramid complex. It was violated by both grave robbers and intrusive burials. His successor, Sahura, built a pyramid north of Saqqara, today's Abusir. Though one of the best preserved, nothing was found in its rectangular burial chamber. Empty, empty, empty. And Pharaoh Kara, who followed on the throne of Egypt, built his funerary complex not far from Sahurus. The chamber in his incomplete pyramid was empty. The monuments of his successor were not found. The pyramid of the next pharaoh has not been found. Probably crumbled to a mound covered by the desert sands. That of his successor was identified only in 1945. Its substructure contained the usual chamber, which was bare and empty. Where were the six dynasty kings really buried? credited with so many pyramids. The royal tombs of that dynasty and of earlier ones were all the way south at Abydos or Abydos. This, as the other evidence, should have completely dispelled the notion that the tombs were cenotaphs and the pyramids the real tombs. Nevertheless, long-held beliefs die hard. The facts bespeak the opposite. The old kingdom pyramids never held a pharaoh's body because they were never meant to hold a king's body. And why in the hell were they built? They weren't built as pyramids. And I've been telling you, they're built as a monument. Before the flood, containing knowledge that God wanted to pass on, so that in the last days, as Isaiah 19 says, to those in this scientific age that say there have been too many translators and too many versions to believe God has a word for us in this scientific age, God can point right there in the shifting sands of the Libyan plateau just on the eastern edge of it at Giza is God's word in stone that's been there all along so God can say, I told you so. Anybody look at it if they want to look. This pyramid Am I boring you?
Okay, Jill. Get my camera helper down here. Mm -hmm. You get your little camera. Here's a cutaway picture, one of the best I've seen. Reader's Digest, no less. Real academic tomb. The world's last mysteries. Now, they have an idea of how the pyramid was built over here to the left. This is one of the many theories propounded. See the workmen going up like uh, the uh, trail around uh, a mountain? Now remember, they got to get one of these a minute up that trail, <laughs> shaped and fitted and cemented in place. I guess when they get up there, they work their way down with those uh, limestone blocks that are the biggest ones. <laughs> so having built them, it'd be an awful long slide down that slick limestone. So one a minute, they had to get those 50 to 70 ton blocks up to the top and work their way down, one a minute. And of course, this theorist didn't study the pyramid enough to know that there was a concavity that represents the three different astronomical years, the uh, solar year, the sidereal, and the nominalistic year. Three different uh, positionings of the Earth in its uh, elliptical orbit. The solar year, when it completes its circle around the sun. The sidereal, when it returns to the same point in its orbit in relation to a fixed star. And the anomalistic, when it returns to the same returns to perihelion, the point in its elliptical orbit that is closest to the sun, and all three of those years are memorialized in the concavity of the Great Pyramid. So they had to make sure that these little trails around it, when they worked their way down, didn't mar that measurement at all, and get them done one a, one a minute. These are the theories that the scientists tell us to believe, you know. That, it's easy to have faith in that. Don't you dare believe what I'm going to tell you. The descending passage proceeds down to a point where it narrows and turns level, comes to an upside down room, which is finished on the top and not on the bottom. So it's an upside down room. Then into a chaotic room that you only avoid the pit by moving right. Then this passage goes on to a dead end. It happens to narrow. Well, let me, I'm going to head to the story. As you come into this entrance, which was hidden with the uh, hinged marble door that was so fine the Arabs couldn't even see it. And displaced 218.1 pyramid inches to the left, or sinister if you use the word Latin. Off center from the north face, it doesn't go in dead center on the axis, but it's offset to the left, 218.1 pyramid inches. And as I already told you, the measuring unit on which it is based is the so-called sacred or pyramid inch, the building block of the universe, one five hundred millionth of the distance from the north to the south pole along the axes of the earth. As you go down this descending passage, you come to a point where there are scored marker lines obviously placed there to mark a certain thing 
whereas the lines are parallel to the floor and perpendicular to the ground, rather, or the base, these chord lines are at a different angle and prominent to mark something. If you extend a rum line of those scored lines, well, let's do it a better way. And if you go down to the base of this and put a mirror or a bottle of water poured on a puddle of water, at a given time, over 2,000, over 2,500 years B.C., the North Pole at that time was the star Thuban, the dragon star in the dragon constellation. And at noon, you could see that North Star all the way from the bottom, just like a sighting bore. And only once would it be off. If you look in the, if you line up on the same day, the North Star, uh, the North Star, which is today. And true north is extending uh, the axis of the Earth out like a rum line to the galaxy of the heavens and hits a certain star. It's Polaris now. But at the same time, Polaris will not shine to the bottom of that because it was built to coordinate with a certain time in history and a certain day in history that can now be astronomically calculated when this star would shine at noon directly down that tube of the descending passage. Now, if you'll take your camera and go to that passage in Chambers by Rutherford over there real quickly, Joe. In fact, if you'll come over here, Larry, and take camera two, I can work with both cameras. That's even easier. 2141 B.C. was the year. when this descending passage so perfectly aligned with the then North Star in that year, 2141 B.C., and you should get the whole diagram if you can, Larry, and we'll be able to see it. I think still read the numbers. No, you can't. Now zoom in to 2141 B.C. where that marker is, where I'm on the descending passage. Zoom on in until I can read the number. There it is, 2141 B.C. And you see a little darker line across the blue. Can you see that on your screen? How many can see it? Zoom in to 2141 B.C. a little closer and they'll see it. Now you that just joined us, we're looking at Rutherford's diagram of the passages of the Great Pyramid. And as you go down this descending passage that is perfectly aligned in 2141 B.C. with the then North Star in the dragon constellation, Thuban, go back to the diagram. There is a marker along the wall of the descending passage, prominent, though it took several investigators to finally notice it, and indeed they noticed it when one, someone concluded there's got to be something there. And they found it. You take that marker that you see the darker line in the blue. The passage itself perfectly telescopes the North Star then in the Dragon Constellation. You extend that line, which is the marker line, and come back to my pencil now, in a rum line out into space as though you had an artificial tunnel you were looking through at this angle, it hits Alcyon in the Pleiades. Now only once in one year do you have that perfect lineup, 2141 B.C. And the equinox day when that star is lined up directly shining down this passageway, taking that as your Benchmark date, counting one year for an inch, you follow this passage descending to the point where it turns level, thus resisting 
the downward plunge. You come to the date that most consistently, which I'm going to speed up this summary tonight, skip over, consistently marks the beginning of the Reformation. You move right on, you come exactly to that period in history that marks the great revolutions from the French Revolution to the American Revolution. You go back from this point of the Reformation on a dating date line or timeline of one inch to a year, exactly 218.1 pyramid inches, which is the uh, displacement error, correct it back up, moving left is away from God's will, moving down away from God's will, moving up toward God, moving right toward God, move back up 218, the exact amount of the displacement error, you come to this well shaft which typifies the death and resurrection of Christ that blasts out exactly at the point that in the upward passage will represent 33 AD. By the same token, at the point where these two passages intersect the floor, you come to 14, give me that date, there you come to, no, no, on down, down, no, the passageway, you're in the well shaft. At 1453 B.C., you have the intersect of a passage that is blocked with granite plugs requiring a miracle to get through. The Arabs chisel past it. And what the ancient uh, Pyramid Book of the Dead, or the Egyptian Book of the Dead, characterized as the uh, Hall of Truth and Darkness, bent over, you have the Exodus man's downward plunge, and the theory being, under the influence of the dragon, Satan, man's path is down to the pit. At 1453 B.C., the exact date on the benchmark of time, this passage requiring a miracle to get through, as the miracles took him out of Egypt, stooped over typifies the truth of knowledge or escape under law. And you come to a date that is marked precisely by the extension of the base of the Queen's Chamber as 2 B.C. And a little triangle called the Christ Triangle is marked by the intersection of these two floor lines. And the intersection marks 2 B.C. and 33 A.D. And at 33 A.D. at the same time, the gallery opens upward 218.1 pyramid inches. You go a little bit further and you come to another triangle, a burst forward that compresses the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. You have other significant dates, but as you go on up, you come to a great step. And that great step is about where we left off teaching. In the 1840s, and then it levels off and goes into the king's chamber. And at this point where the open gallery ends and you are suddenly depressed into a low chamber area that you go through, zoom in on that area, Larry, drop down to the date. At 1914, the exact date that we entered into the First World War, you go into this low passage and start moving forward to the King's Chamber. The dates keep moving on to 1979 where the floor changes to granite from limestone. They're shown in red. You move on into the King's Chamber and you turn right again 218.1 pyramid inches and you come to the coffer. Now the theory is that you can trace, come to my pencil point, you can trace the downward route of man under the influence of Satan and the history of the world under that influence year by year to the point where the downward flow is resisted by the Reformation 
the great ref reformations of the world are encased in this upside down chamber and then you move into this terrible chaotic state at 1914 get that lower passage in the pit there the bottom where I am Larry move to the right AD go on over like see the date AD 1521 it narrows or contracts moves to what you see the little bulge of the upside down room and then as you enter the chaotic area move it left with the danger of falling off into the pit move on over you enter into that chaotic period in 1914 the same as the compressed area above bring your camera up enters into this compressed area of a period of great travail as you move toward the king's chamber in the chaotic days of last times not by chance I insist the lineup between Alcyon, the heavenly star in the Pleiades that received such a positive picture from Job through the Psalms, where the crosshair benchmark is marked by the rum line that goes to the Pleiades, Alcyon in that constellation, and the extension of the descending passage to the then North Star. Thuban and the dragon constellation under the influence of Satan man is without hope and will end up dead end and in the pit God gives the miraculous deliverance showing a way up the book of the dead calls it the way of truth and darkness rather it's the way of escape but under the yoke of the law you have to walk stooped over and if you slip there's nothing to catch you as you go down and by miracle God led this revelatory people but coinciding with the dates 2 BC the birth of Christ and 33 AD the resurrection of Christ you have both the escape from the downward way 218 back same reconstruction of the error of 218.1 pyramid inches a symbol of deviation from God's plan from the way of faith revealed in the Reformation and the temporary leveling out the displacement factor rectified and brought back brings you to that type of the miracle deliverance of God through grace that takes us in Christ through the path of his resurrection as the first fruits of the resurrection the way of truth stooped over and under law opens up in seven great tiers to the way of truth in light as you go up the way of faith the gospel way and enter into the last days and make your way to the open coffin in the king's chamber I've not yet talked about this side road Lemassurier would have us believe that this is the lesser Christianity of Paul that this is the way of Paul the way of grace this one stays in legalism and you can go where you want with that I got plenty to say about it when I talk about the King's Chamber so that's why no one book is adequate Lemus Surier says just exactly the opposite of what he should say he says this is a deviation of the Pauline way and he would have the little step down right after the pyramid that signifies the uh, messianic period of Paul's ministry somehow typifying those who step down with his ministry and follow this path of inferior Christianity rather those who step down from Paul and stay in law as those who stayed in law and didn't accept the message of Christ or head in this direction those that have been redeemed through Christ whether from this path or at that point in his delivering act move on with ever increasing faith up toward the king's chamber and there will be those that rule and reign over those that make them another route make it by another route but that's way ahead of the story 
That is God's message. All of the mathematical genius and building qualities that make this the seventh great wonder of the world was but the packaging to get the attention to the message that was contained therein. It was never built for some dead body. They worshiped this pyramid that was already there, built before the flood ever came, and all this other crap and attachment merely reflects their amazement and their worship of this place of light without knowing what the message was therein, which is God's message to be revealed in the last days so God can say, I told you so, with this pillar and monument at the center and at the edge of Egypt in the last days. Now, I want to take us down this path inch by inch, not just gestalted as I have now, and take us particularly through this period, which we're so interested in from the study of the Bible and God's Word and the restoration of the Word in man's uh, ordinary and daily language, through these great revelation, or rather revolutions, and coordinate them with the period of the upward path of those men and women of faith that also are up here. You've never let me stay with it long enough to give the detail in this area and in this area that I've given getting to those points. But every time we get to those points, we have a budget crisis. With God's help and your faithfulness, that history is behind us. And we can move on, if you're interested. If you are, get on the telephone.